Hi everyone, and uh, sorry it's been so long since my last real upload. Um, I've been just extremely, extremely busy lately, and uh, with just a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, logistical stuff in real life that I need to have, you know, get done. And, uh, and I've just sort of just been under constant pressure from that. So, um, but I did, uh, I did promise a voice for men that I would upload a video asking people to please kindly donate uh, to their fundraiser and uh, I'm gonna put the link in the low bar for that. Um, they're doing, they do this four times a year and uh, and basically the website runs strictly on donations so uh, if you want them to keep producing good content uh, yeah you're gonna have to cough up a little bit of money and uh, you can also set up a monthly amount that would automatically be debited from your PayPal account or, or what have you as well so lots of options there and uh, I would actually really recommend that people donate and uh, you could also visit there I think they have a Zazzle store where they sell merchandise and uh, that would probably help them a little bit too so, other than that, uh, and and my hectic, crazy life lately, um, I I was interviewed uh, maybe about a month ago by a journalist for Maclean's magazine, which is sort of Canada's version of Time, and uh, about Earl Silverman's death. And the journalist, a woman uh, who's called Mika Rakai, we had an interesting discussion. And, you know, she seemed really pleasant. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that she's not planning on doing a hit piece. Um, if she isn't planning on writing a hit piece, it's probably a toss-up as to whether the article is going to make it past her editor's desk. Um, something she admitted could well happen. And uh, she has not contacted me to let me know that the article is actually up. I suppose I should go have a look and see what's what. Um, but... After, uh, you know, some of her questions got got me thinking. You know, at one point I mentioned to her that uh, that what used to be radical feminist thought is now mainstream. And I'm not even talking mainstream feminist. I'm talking mainstream culture. You know, like if, for instance, you walked up to anyone on the street and said women were historically oppressed, their answer would be, well, yeah, of course. Right, and and I've even seen MRAs and MRM friendly people like Christina Hoff Summers parrot that line of thinking that that women in the past were oppressed because they were women, and and Ms. Rakai responded with something along the lines of, "Wait, so you don't believe women were oppressed?" And uh, yeah, no, no, I don't. Um, I, I tried to explain myself to her but I don't know if my arguments were as cogent as they could have been, and Ms. Rakai, if you're watching now, um, this would be a, a good explanation. Uh, it's often very difficult to sort of pick through these things uh, in a 10-minute interview or a half-hour interview over the phone, so I wrote them all down, and now I'm going to explain my reasoning. And I'm also going to explain my reasoning to my sister, uh, who... She, she has some bit of knowledge about military operations in Afghanistan and, uh, and has come across certain customs uh, that exist in Afghanistan, specifically the local custom uh, that uh, when people seek medical care through free clinics uh, run by the military or by NGOs, the tradition is men first, children second, women last. Now, I had asked my sister if she could come up with some reason other than, you know, men are privileged or because penis to explain that custom. And she said, well, yeah, I suppose the reasoning for it is that if the man dies, the whole family is toast. That if the man gets too sick to work, the whole family suffers. And at the same time, she attributed that state of affairs to the fact that under Taliban rule and mm, sort of the, the residual local custom, uh, only men are allowed to work outside the home. That men, you know, were in fact the only ones allowed to even leave the home unaccompanied. 
Now, one thing I did mention to uh, the journalist, uh, Ms. Rakai, was that the Taliban had been very, very clever uh, in how they forced both genders into extremely restricted and regimented sets of roles and duties. Uh, they restrict the freedoms of those who value safety over freedom, women, and thereby impose the role of provider and protector onto men, falsely naming it freedom. And uh, so, you know, if you have two people and one of them is ordered to stay home and you tell the other that he's free to go outside, well, what do you have? You know, you got two people stuck in their roles, not just one. The second person's no more free to decide what he wants to do than the first one. There's only two of them. One's confined to the home, not allowed to work. Someone's got to go out and perform the tasks that require interaction with the world. Neither of these people are free. And one of them is at significantly greater day-to-day -day risk in a place like Afghanistan. Hint, it's not the one who stays indoors. Now, Ms. Rakai did mention, uh, she did make the statement or ask the sort of the rhetorical question, well, wouldn't you rather be free even if that meant that you were at, in extreme danger, you know, that you might get shot? And I think that's just a really, really, really stupid question to ask somebody who's never been in that position because, frankly, I don't have an answer. I Would I rather stay in the house or be free to walk around and risk getting my brains blown out. You know, like, honestly, I kind of like the house. Um, I, I just, I really don't think that that's a question that anybody can answer unless they're put in that position. Now, things weren't always like this in Afghanistan. You know, prior to decades of proxy warfare that ravaged their country, Afghan society was actually kind of progressive, relatively speaking. Most Westerners would probably be surprised by the number of older women who had been confined to their homes by the Taliban and barred from paid work who were educated professionals. But people who understand how societies operate understand that safety and pro prosperity go hand in hand with the relaxing of often stringent cultural and legal standards. When the Soviets invaded, all that progressiveness kind of went out the window, and after 30 years of other societies taking a wrecking ball to their country, the Afghans found themselves back in a dark ages of poverty and conflict, subsistence living, and regional warlords interested in grabbing land and power, crushing the poor and the hapless under their boot heels to do it. Now, regardless of what they delivered, the Taliban offered order. A top-down method of controlling the chaotic that was at least nominally based on a moral doctrine to which most Afghans already subscribed to one degree or another. Uh, the Taliban offered to slash back the power-grabbing of warlords to replace it with a life path for ordinary people, well, which, while rep repressive and totalitarian, appeared, at least on the surface, to be a safe one, as long as you didn't ever step off it. The Taliban offered a narrow fundamentalist interpretation of the social and moral structure that had already existed within the culture, and it represented a codifying of what had previously been random, Unlike under the warlord system of regional government, under the Taliban, you at least had some idea as to what kind of behaviors were going to get you shot in the back of the head. When things go haywire in a society, often people will look to totalitarian and authoritarian systems of, uh, of imposing order on their lives. They, this is just what, what people do. Now, one thing the Taliban didn't do was completely rewrite Islamic law pertaining to female privilege and male obligation. And this is the root of things, the way I see it. Afghanistan became a society where leaving your house was taking your life in your hands, and where there were few opportunities to earn money or generate productivity, but where people still need to eat. And under, as, under Islamic law, women bear no economic responsibility to anyone not even themselves. Now, I watched a video not too long ago where a Muslim woman named Zara Faris in London used this very state of affairs as uh, an argument uh, as to why Muslim women do not need feminism. Uh, 
According to her, Islamic law does not specifically prohibit women from working. On the contrary, Muslim women can not only work under Islamic law, but they need not share their earned income with their families. Basically, if a Muslim woman has a job, the money she earns is hers and hers alone, while her husband remains obligated to provide any and all economic support for the family, including the necessities his working wife requires. Now, I work with a man from Lebanon who confirmed that aspect of things for me. He has a wife and five children, and he works two jobs to support them. His wife stays at home, and that's exactly where he wants her. Not because he's a dominating, repressive, misogy misogynistic man, but because if she chose to work outside the home, he and their children have no right to the smallest share of her income, and yet he's still required to provide for his wife's ba basic needs. On the other hand, if she was working, daycare would become a necessity to the family, and it would be my co-worker who would be stuck with the bill. In other words, if his wife chose to work outside the home to pay for luxuries only she has any right to indulge in with that money, he would have to take a third job to make it possible for her to do so. And I suppose a lot of Muslim women think this is just great when times are easy. But it results in a lot of not-so-great things for Muslim women when things get harsh. Or at least, not so great by our standards. Because when you have a group of people who must use their productivity to support themselves and others, and another group of people who are entitled to be supported by the productivity of others and have no obligation to even be productive, well, when the shit hits the fan, which of these groups is going to be barred from taking the few available jobs? Will it be the group who must use their income to support themselves and other people, or the ones who don't even have to feed themselves? Under Islamic law, a woman with a job can technically allow her own children to starve, even if she has the money to feed them. If those children do starve, it's her husband who will be considered socially, morally, and legally accountable for failing to provide them the necessities of life. And while I doubt there are many women who would actually do this, it's just the way it works. In Afghanistan today, a woman with a job, a job she doesn't need, remember, is not just taking that job from a man. She's taking food out of the mouths of that man's wife and kids. If she takes a safe, easy job, as women are wont to do, then the man she displaces will have to take a more dangerous one. And if he's killed, his wife and kids have no means to support themselves. And this custom is so strict regarding this set of entitlements and obligations that in Afghanistan you can find 13-year-old boys whose fathers have been killed selling themselves as sex slaves to provide for their mother and sisters. Likewise, if that woman's daughter takes one of the few available spots in school, someone else's son will be denied an education and the future job he will be obligated to take to support both himself and the people who are entitled to his support will be less well-paying, and the quality of life of a bunch of people are going to suffer. Now, a similar situation re regarding this kind of set of entitlements and obligations uh, existed in the Western world after feminism had had its way with the second half of the 19th century. Prior to that time, a woman's income and property was subsumed by her husband when she married. But depending on where you are, that all changed sometime between the mid-1800s and the turn of the century. At which point, women's income and property rights in the West actually kind of became a carbon copy of what exists under Islam. A story in the Milwaukee Journal from 1912 that I'm going to link in the low bar illustrates this quite well in its examination of the tactics of British suffragettes who used a loophole in the law to turn their husbands into prison cell activists by manipulating the exact same legal and cultural standards that are at play in Afghanistan. To elaborate, a married woman's income and property had been emancipated by feminist activism from the institution of family for some time. Not just from her husband's influence, mind you, but from anyone's benefit but her own. However, her husband's patriarchal obligations to finance her necessities remained intact, and one of those necessities was actually the burden of taxation on her income. If she earned, earned income, her husband and children had no right to touch it. But her husband, not her, was the person obligated to pay taxes on that income. 
if he had no means to pay it, you know, after paying for all of the material necessities of the entire family, including his wife, it was he who would go to prison for tax evasion. Now, what I find amusing in all of this, since in the West these circumstances only emerged due to feminist activism, is that Islamic law had enshrined these particular ideals of women's liberation long before the Declaration of Sentiments was signed at Seneca Falls, or even before Mary Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women in the late 1700s. This is why the idea of male privilege is so fucking bogus. Privileges are entitlements. What men have had through history was not entitlement, because it was a necessary element of performing their obligations, a tool handed to them because it was needed by men in order to fulfill their legally, economically, and socially enforced obligations to women and children, not because penis. See, there are these things called duties and things called rights. And to have a duty, it necessarily entails having a right. You know, the rights granted people generally facilitate their ability to perform their duties. And if one has no such duties, the rights required to fulfill them are not only unnecessary, they might actually, in some situations, be detrimental to the ability of others to fulfill their duties to you. If you have a duty to be economically productive and utilize that productivity to provide for yourself and others, you must have a right to engage in activities that result in economic productivity. If you have a duty to make sure you and others have the material necessities of life, such as clothing, food, and shelter, you must have the right to determine that any money you have is spent on clothing, food, and shelter. If you have a duty to protect yourself and others, you must have the right to make decisions for yourself and those you protect, and a right to place yourself in danger. If you don't have those duties, you don't need the rights attached to them. In fact, you having those rights may actually interfere with the ability of others to provide you the, the entitlements you enjoy. And this is really going to play out when everyone's living on the bottom tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs you're probably not going to be given those rights unless you have the duties. Because you having the rights would interfere with the ability of those who have the duties to perform their duties for you or for someone else who is entitled to their obligation. A husband can't fulfill his duty to provide for a wife if someone else's wife displaces him from the workforce. A husband cannot fulfill his duty to ensure his family has the things they need if he doesn't manage the family purse. A husband cannot fulfill his duty to protect his wife if she is not required to duck when he says duck. Historically, all of these things, provisioning, protection, and support, were female entitlements. And I hate to borrow a phrase from feminism, but what happened in Afghanistan during, you know, under the Taliban around barring women from work and girls from education is essentially female privilege backfiring on women and girls. When jobs are scarce, you don't give them to people who have an entitlement to benefit from the obligation of others to work. When education is scarce, you don't give that to people who have an entitlement to benefit from the obligation of others that is facilitated by education. You give those things to the people who have a duty to share the benefits of them with others, not the people who are legally allowed to hog all those benefits for themselves. Afghanistan is not a society that oppresses women. Is it oppressive? Oh yeah. But it's a society where everyone is stuck in the grip of cr cruel circumstances and Islamic laws that burden men with duties that require rights and bestow entitlements on women that don't require rights, and they're all coping the best way they can. And the only way you're going to improve the situation for women and girls in Afghanistan, you know, get them access to jobs outside the home or to educations, and not have a huge backlash, is to remove the entitlement women have to the material support and protection of men, and thereby remove men's obligation to provide those things. Until you do that, you're just spinning your wheels. You're actually harming the only people who have any obligation to anyone but themselves, while handing unfettered potential to earn money and get power to people who don't even have the duty to feed their own children. Another example of this, uh, this idea of, you know, female privilege backfiring 
And no, I don't actually consider it privilege in in Afghanistan because it is reciprocated by female obligations to men. Uh, in China, not so much anymore. Um, but the the growing sex gap in births in China is a result of this kind of thing. Uh, female fetuses are selected for abortion, female babies are often abandoned, drowned, or smothered, and feminists would have you believe that this is because men in China are privileged and arbitrarily overvalued, and women are hated and arbitrarily undervalued. But you can read any Chinese newspaper and come across articles about this elderly couple or that elderly couple suing their sons for not taking proper care of them in their old age. You never see any of them suing their daughters, because their daughters have no obligation, legal or social, to take care of their parents. A girl's parents actually, arguably, have an obligation to take care of her if she doesn't get married and can't or refuses to support herself. For all of Mao's rhetoric about women holding up half the sky, he didn't seem to do anything to ensure that women did so when the sky was full of elderly people who needed economic support, did he? He liberated women by encouraging they exploit their economic productivity without holding them responsible even for themselves, and oddly enough kept men chained to their traditional non-egalitarian ob obligations. In China, today, you essentially have no social safety net to speak of, nothing much in the way of social security or pensions, no one but your son, really, to take care of you and make sure you don't starve when you're too old to work. And you have a policy that allows you to only have one child. What do you think is going to happen when those policies coincide? You know, when a one-child policy is coupled with a set of gender duties and entitlements that mean a family who has a boy is a potentially a two-child family, son and daughter-in-law, and one who has a girl is in the best-case scenario, a no-child family. If feminists really cared about what's going on in China, what they do is agitate to burden women with a duty of care for their parents or emancipate men from said duty. That would probably even out the birth rate fairly quick. And I know this because there are families in China who want girls, who even favor them, because if they didn't, given this harsh economic incentive, families wouldn't be having girls much at all. But a lot of them do. And uh, in rural areas where families can sometimes get away with having more than one child, they'll often have a girl as well as a boy. But you won't stop people from preferring boys under a one-child policy until you obligate girls to be as useful and exploitable to their families as boys are. You just won't. You especially won't if men's obligations make them useful to their parents, while women's entitlements make them a potential burden to those parents in old age. You certainly won't solve the problem by attributing it to male privilege and lack of equal rights for women, because that is not what's causing it. What's causing it is a lack of equal obligation for women. You can give women all the same rights as men, but if they don't have the same obligations as men, they won't be treated equally, and that inequality is going to emerge in extreme forms during extreme circumstances, like Afghanistan after 30 years of decimation, and China when people are only allowed one child and circumstances are such that that one child will be either your lifeline or a pair of cement shoes when you're too old to work. Societies don't oppress women or privilege men. They do tend to treat men and women differently and exploit them in different ways. What feminism seems to be about is expanding women's rights without applying any obligations, and expanding women's entitlements while freeing them from the restrictions and obligations that used to be necessary uh, on women's part for men to be able to fulfill them. They're about giving women the advantages of being a man without any of the costs, and about removing the costs of being a woman without giving up any of the advantages. When men got the vote, and for a long time prior to that actually, they were obligated to serve their countries if need be, through military conscription, and they were obligated to serve their communities through civil conscription, things like bucket brigades. When women got the vote, there was no reciprocal obligation placed on them. When men used to receive automatic custody after divorce, it was because they were solely obligated to support the children. When early feminists pushed through the Tender Years doctrine, that obligation did not shift onto women. 
Mothers got custody, but fathers were still required to provide material support. Incidentally, once this doctrine was in place, the divorce rate, which had been a constant for centuries, increased 15-fold in just 50 years. And that bill that was recently vetoed in Florida, that might have ended lifetime alimony if it had passed, one of the primary justifications in the media for that bill was that more women were finding themselves paying lifetime alimony to former partners due to mass male unemployment during the recession. And those women had just never expected that they'd have, you know, have to, and, and they thought it was unfair. And by more women, I'm thinking probably 3% of all lifetime alimony payers in Florida. What do you know? Being treated like a man in every single way just ain't that great. Contrary to what feminists try to tell people, never has been. That bill was put forward because women don't like to be obligated the way men are, to pay their whole lives for the upkeep of a former spouse, and even a tiny percentage of them being forced to do it will get people to rethink a law that has obligated men for decades or even centuries. Hell, just dare to suggest that a woman who chooses to have a baby without the consent of the biological father should be solely financially responsible for that child, let alone that a woman who chose to leave her husband out of boredom and take the kids with her should finance her own decision, and you'll face vicious opposition from most feminists, even though that exact situation, getting the kids and the entire job of feeding them, is defined as historical male privilege and patriarchal oppression of women when it used to happen to men. Frankly, if women today were forced to bear a fraction of the burdens that were historically imposed on men, for which their greater rights were little more than the tools required to do the job, I think 99% of women would consider it a raw deal, and 99% of feminists would call it oppression of women. The fact that they'd see it that way just shows how privileged in many ways women have always been, and how shallow feminists' view of the world, past and present, actually is. So, feminists, I got an idea. How about you perform a little experiment? First, go to China and try to sell the idea of obligating daughters economically to their parents the way sons are. See if any of, you know, those young women will jump at the opportunity to take care of shit like a man is expected to do. Next, go to Afghanistan and tell women they're allowed to do anything their husbands do. Work, get an education, even have custody of the children. Hell, tell them they can have all the best jobs. All they have to do is give up any and all entitlements to provision and protection and any and all obligation on the part of the men in their lives, fathers, husbands, brothers, and sons, to help or support them. And let them know they'll have to single-handedly provide for the material needs of any children they have. You're on your own, honey. Girl power. Good luck. How many Afghan women does anyone think would take him up on it? When even in a middle-class London neighborhood, where she enjoys a set of rights similar to men's and would actually be capable of real economic independence, a Muslim woman can argue against feminism on the basis that Muslim women might have to give up codified female entitlements provided through male obligation. Well, Zara, Zara Ferris, I hate to tell you this, but you really don't have to worry about any of that. You should stop arguing against feminism because feminists aren't going to take away your privileges or remove your husband's obligations to you. They're only interested in taking away his privileges and removing your obligations to him. So, I don't see what problem you could have with that. Well, unless you have something called principles and a sense of fairness and some other things that, you know, most human beings should have, but that feminists don't. Anyhow, that is all I have to say uh, about that for today, and uh, I'm going to just uh, remind everybody once again to donate to A Voice for Men and uh, try and get their numbers up. And uh, thank you so much again for coming through for Tom Matty. I really appreciate that, and he, uh, he was in tears practically. Um, at how quickly uh, the support rolled in for him. And I'm waiting on tenterhooks to find out how his case is going. So thanks a bunch, and I will see you guys all later.